How's it going folks? Cam's here with a video. I was going to do a blog post about this, but I thought I'd rather just talk into the video and riff. There's no script, nothing like that. I'm going to talk today probably for about 20 minutes. It's going to be a long one. I'm going to talk about the biggest event that ever happened to me because today is the 30th anniversary of said event and it changed everything. Everything. I joined the army at 16. Okay, we'll start from there. Went into the Royal Corps of Signals as an apprentice. I started out as a radio telegraphist and then I switched to become an electronic warfare operator which was the intelligence arm of the Royal Signals and I learned Russian. Turns out I was quite good at it. I made a career out of it, but we'll get to that. At the age of 17, we went on an external leadership exercise into the Lake District. And these were the good exercises, not the military ones where you got beasted. These were the ones where you got to go exploring, canoeing, skiing, hiking. And you didn't get treated like, like children. You got treated like proper soldiers. So it was great. We went in July, obviously. This is the anniversary. Lake District. Sunny, sunny day. This was the canoeing exercise round about the Grassmere area. And we split into two groups. One group went canoeing, the other group went hiking. And it was a kind of orienteering exercise. And I was in the orienteering group. So off we went up a mountain called Grassmoor. And we were looking for checkpoints and ticking boxes. There was a group of us with a sergeant in charge and a group of apprentices, some of whom had apprentice rank. Now the sergeant who was with us had given us some training on how to use ropes and stuff like that. So we had ropes with us but we didn't use them. We had them in our backpacks. We were scrambling up a scree slope and we got to the bottom of a cliff and the sergeant had a discussion with the apprentice sergeant and they decided that we would take the chance of going up this cliff to try and save a couple of hours of time going the long way round. And so that's what we did. The sergeant went first, then another guy and then me. The sergeant dislodged a rock which came bouncing down and hit the guy above me on the head. He fell backwards into me and knocked me off the cliff. Now all I can remember is the weight of my Bergen pulling me back and reaching that point of no return and then falling backwards. Bounced down the hill and stopped. I had smashed up my tibia and fibula in my right leg. Open fractures so bones were sticking out both sides. It was pretty horrendous. I'd broken my collarbone, I'd broken some teeth, I had a fracture in my skull and of course abrasions and cuts all over and it was it was pretty horrendous. This was 1989 so no mobile phones or anything like that, no means of communicating with with anyone further down the hill so first aid was administered and somebody was sent down to contact the mountain rescue team. And I lay on that hillside for about four hours before the helicopter came and picked me up and took me to Whitehaven in the uh, Lake District, Cumbria. So I went to the Westmoreland Hotel in Whitehaven Hotel Hospital in Cumbria. And I was in there for a few weeks. It was touch and go whether my leg was going to be saved or not. They did contemplate just amputating. They decided that they would operate, clean it out and see if the wounds would remain free of infection, which they did, thankfully. It was, the wounds were filled with dirt and I'd been laying on the hillside for such a long time that they didn't know whether the, the it would get infected and, and end up having to be amputated. I got to keep it and I'm still not sure whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. I know how technology is and how it's advanced with, with pros prosthetic limbs. <coughs> and I might very well be pain-free had they done that. 
and my recovery might not have taken such a long time and my mental health may not have been affected the way that it has been. Anyway, that's what happened in July 1989. That began a long phase of operations. I ended up having 13 surgeries, bone grafts, skin grafts, external fixators, muscle flaps where they removed some muscle from my calf, put it over the wound to get the blood flow increased to enable the healing to take place. And that went on until 1993 when I was finally discharged and went to university. So 1989 it happened. 1990 I got back to the Apprentices College in Harrogate with walking sticks but I was able to to get around and so they allowed me to finish my apprenticeship as a Russian linguist. They changed it from electronic warfare operator to telecommunications operator brackets linguist. And it turns out, as I said, I was good at the Russian and I ended up becoming best in my class. Now the instructors could see that that was the kind of skill that I had and so there was my second in command of the squadron Captain House, he advocated for keeping me in because the military aspect of things wasn't important for them or for me because I was good at what I was doing trade-wise but it wasn't allowed. There are minimum fitness requirements that you have to pass to be in the military and obviously I was not going to be able to meet those requirements and so I ended up with a discharge. I did graduate as best linguist in my intake. I got the, the Commandant's Prize from the Army Apprentices College in Harrogate. And I remember speaking to the reviewing officer whom you got to talk to if you were a prize winner. And he congratulated me. Well done, young man. It's the first step in a, a great military career. And I was like, well, actually, sir, it's not. I'm on the discharge papers, so that's the end for me. And And it was... But before that, as soon as I graduated, they had agreed to take me back in for more surgery because the leg had healed, but it had healed. It was short and it was crooked. And so they'd offered me to have this pioneering surgery, which would allow them to extend the bone once it began to heal. I'll put a picture in. The, the, the metal work that was installed was called an Ilazarov frame, which was pioneered by a Russian orthopaedic surgeon to straighten children's legs who had rickets so their bones were bowed and this framework was able to strengthen, straighten and lengthen the bone. So what that involved was breaking the bone again. At that time I had metal work on the bone, it was holding the bone together. So they removed that, broke the bone again and then put in this fixator which you could use to turn screws on the rings. There were rings and pins. You'll see the photograph. I'll put one in the video. And so once the bone began to heal, I would leave it for four or six weeks. And then I would begin to turn these screws a quarter of a millimetre each day. And I would do that for four weeks. And then I would leave it for four weeks. And then again for another four weeks. And I wore that thing for nine months. The interesting anecdote with that is that when I got the external frame fitted and they allowed me to leave, they, they sent me home. This was at the military hospital in London. It was Queen Elizabeth Military Hospital in Woolwich. And they allowed me to go home once I'd healed enough to go home on sick leave. But I couldn't get any clothes on. <laughs> so I ended up having to wait an extra day while my brother sent his kilt down to me. And I was able to go home wearing the kilt. And I wore that kilt for the next nine months. So that's where my love of the kilt really came from. And nine months of... It, that's where the mental health and the anguish began. Because it's one thing going through trauma like that when it's beyond your control. It's quite another thing to go through that healing process again voluntarily. You know what I mean? That's what was difficult for me. And I stoically got through it. I was able to not let it hold me back very much. 
I knew that the discharge was coming so I used my sick leave time to go back to school and study because when I left school at 16 I hadn't really graduated properly from school with any kind of qualifications at all and so university was not an option based on even the army career and the academic side of the army apprentices college wasn't going to be enough to get me into uni so I went back to school for two years whilst on the army payroll so that was from 91 through to 93 and I did some hires at school including Russian and eventually was accepted to St Andrews University where I began at the age of 21 in 1993 and that was a five-year degree course which included a one year abroad in Ukraine and I ended up with a 2-1 degree in Russian language and literature I then followed that up with a master's degree at Bradford University where I studied interpreting and translation and then moved to Kazakhstan to get a job as a Russian translator. My Russian became fluent and that became my job. So the army first of all discovered that I did have a brain in my head. My school was terrible, went to Prestwick Academy so if anyone from Prestwick Academy in the 80s is watching this you'll know what I'm talking about. The school was dreadful. Some people obviously got through it and excelled, but I was not one of those people who could do that without proper encouragement and support from the teachers, which I didn't get. I didn't realise that till much later, though. I always believed that it was just down to me and my bad behaviour. But now as a parent, I understand a bit better what schools are supposed to do with, with pupils, and they didn't do that for me. When I got back as a 19 year old and did those two years I had just come from the army, when I went into the army they discovered not only did I have an aptitude for languages but they were able to get the best out of me. I'm not sure how but they did. The teacher I had, particularly the Russian teacher, was phenomenal. One of the best teachers of anything I've ever had. His name was Dave Wollstonecroft and I don't know if he's still around but if you're there Dave I'd just like to thank you for everything that you did for me. You encouraged me as no other teacher has ever done and I shall be forever grateful to you for that. That was, it was an amazing part of my life to go through that at the age of 16 or well, 17 I would have been because I passed off in my passing out parade on my 17th birthday. So from the age of 17 when I began my academic career as it was it was all down to Dave. So thank you, Dave. And then to come out of that with a degree, which is something I always used to think other people got, that was not for me. I used to meet friends of mine that I was at school with who had graduated with degrees and I would put them on a kind of pedestal. I always thought, wow, a degree, it just meant it was unattainable for me. And so to get that, in 1998, when I graduated with a 2-1, I read War and Peace in Russian. Can you believe that? And it was just an amazing point in my life to have achieved a university degree, and not only a university degree, a degree from the most prestigious school, arguably, in Scotland. I think many people would agree with that. If it's good enough for the prince of the realm, you know what I mean? It's good enough for me. And so that did quite a lot for my mental health, my self-esteem, etc. But I've since learned that the, the trauma of that time, the recovery, etc. It led to alcoholism, it led to drugs. And I've been sober now for 13 years. Uh, that's with the help of the AA programme, Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got depression at the moment, I'm suffering and I'm on medication. I seem to be stable. It's not terribly debilitating at the moment, although it has been in the past. Issues of self-esteem, grandiosity, all that baggage. And it wasn't until quite recently that I came to the conclusion that perhaps it was that traumatic period in my life, which I don't know that it caused it, but it certainly will have contributed to it. But that was the biggest event in my life, falling off that cliff in July 1989 changed everything and now I look at it philosophically 
I live in the beautiful location. I've got a lovely wife, two beautiful children, and my life is is as it is. I am where I am now, and I need to to learn to find happiness with that and gratitude. And I do, I do have those things in my life. Gratitude is a big part of my life, and I know it's not a big enough part, but it is there. It really is. Sometimes when I look at what my pals are doing, some of the guys that I served with, a few of them are still in, so we're looking at over the 22 years now, obviously. So they must have extended their contracts and, and remained in the military, and I wonder where they've been. Obviously, they can't say because security, etc. I wonder where I would have been, what I would have done, how my life would be, you know, but I try not to be bitter about it. I try not to dwell on it too much. It's entirely possible that my life could have been much worse had I stayed in. It's entirely possible that my life would be over now if I had stayed in. That has happened to some people that I served with. They're no longer with us because of what happened to them in the military. I know others who are suffering much more mental anguish than I. And my heart goes out to them because you serve your country and you end up with health issues, you know. And so I suppose this is just a a message to anyone who's experiencing trauma and difficulty at the moment. It can lead to things that you can never imagine. A university degree is just amazing. Not only did I get that, I got a postgraduate degree, I got a master's degree, all of which now I look back on. I graduated in 1999 with my master's, and so we're now in 2019, so there's another anniversary right there. But I look back on that as it's, it's an amazing achievement, yes, but, you know, I put the work in, and I think I deserve it. In fact, I'm, I'm sure that I do. I'll talk a little bit about music because I started to play guitar when I was going through that recovery phase. Bought my first guitar in 1991, I think it was. And now guitar's my passion. It's my job, hopefully. I'm trying to make it so with my music, my teaching, my YouTube channel, etc. And music, and particularly acoustic guitar, was my companion through all of those traumatic times and beyond. It's been a constant companion to me. And that's something that I'm not sure would have come about. I don't know. I can't possibly say. And I don't need to be able to say. I didn't really think of that at the time as being therapy. I didn't pick it up because I was looking for therapy. I probably didn't even really know what therapy meant at that time other than the rehabilitation centre that I went to, which was in Headley Court near Leatherhead, sort of Aldershot area, and that was a, a joint services rehab unit for people who'd been through traumatic uh, injuries, and it was to get me back on my feet again. To me, that's what therapy was. I'd never thought of it with, with the mental health aspect, but obviously that's what it was doing for me, and that was a most amazing thing that could have happened to me because that also became a huge thing in my life. I don't use the Russian anymore and that's something I'm a little bit sad about. I miss it. I miss it greatly. But I did meet so many great people through travelling and working in, in Russian-speaking countries. I discovered a lot about myself and I discovered, well, I discovered alcoholism too. That was a big part of it, is being in a strange country like that where you can drink so cheaply and so freely without, at that time, having a wife or family, you know. But I've worked on that too, and I am what's called a grateful alcoholic because I've learned so much about myself just through the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. And some of the discussions now that I have with people, with friends, are deep and meaningful and spiritual. I have become much more of a spiritual person through that and also through self-awareness and self-study and all that, which comes from 
from being messed up on drugs and alcohol for such a long time and then getting clean so that it can be done folks if you're suffering with any of that seek help you know it can be done you don't have to wait till your rock bottom hits I was lucky I didn't lose everything I managed to hold on to my family and that's another thing to be grateful for that my wife stuck by me so I don't know how long I've talked for timeline on my camera doesn't show me it just shows me must be around 20 minutes the way so I'll sign off I'll just leave this message out there to anyone suffering from any kind of trauma then know that it can get better that good things can come from it I know it's a cliche to say it but every cloud has a silver lining and I've found that to be true in my life so I hope you've enjoyed watching my soliloquy as I talk about 30 years of recovery Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.